this is Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Graymoor, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, Do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy to be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. Blessed Justin DeJacobus. Ethiopia is an ancient land, the biblical land of Cush, ruled for centuries by the dynasty descended from the Hebrew King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, converted to Christianity a thousand years before the discovery of America, schismatic in the 7th century, and then for 800 years cut off from the Christian world by the Muslim conquest of Egypt and Nubia. Communication established in 1490 and Ethiopia became the center of missionary activity by the Jesuits, who were then expelled in 1633. It is now 1839, and at Adua, capital of the Tigray province, the ruler, King Ubi, and a Coptic monk are awaiting the arrival of an important visitor. Abba Michael, how shall I address this man Rome sends to our land? The Catholics address their priests as father. Then I shall call him father. Father, uh, well, by what name is he known? Father Justin de Jacobis. Did you say you had read something about him? There was a story about him in an Italian paper when it was announced he was to lead the Ethiopian mission. I have it with me. Read it to me. It uh, tells the place and date of birth, 1800. Mm, 39. A good age. It relates to his education, his various positions, and of his courage and devotion during the cholera outbreak that won for him the people's love. Father de Jacobis, writes the editor, is one of those evangelical workers who know how to bring the works of nature under dominion of religion and to attract to Jesus Christ the wise man and the scholar, no less than the ignorant and the simple. The wise men and scholars are few, the ignorant and simple many. The high regard the Congregation of Missions has for Father de Jacobi's capabilities is evidenced by the fact that for over 200 years, death was the penalty for any Catholic entering Ethiopia. At times, I've questioned myself whether it was wise to permit this mission. Half our people are non-Christian. Whatever help we can get should be beneficial. But aren't you afraid, Abba Michael, that he will make converts for his own church? I have no fear. Once they've become Christian, they will choose the church of their native land, not one whose authority is far away. Uh, listen. He's been sighted. Greet him in my name and take him to his dwelling. I will see him at the feast tonight. Father Justin, you ate very little at our feast of welcome. You don't care for our food? Your Highness, I hope I've not offended. But it's a habit of a lifetime to eat sparingly. Here, people eat that which is placed before them, for they are uncertain of the next meal. But no matter. Father Justin, Abba Michael, shall we now talk of Father's mission here? I've talked to a number of the clergy. And what do they say? 
Some are angry about the mission. Some feel they should withhold comment. Some few are in favor. I will speak openly with you, Father Justin. Personally, I am well disposed to your mission, but many are not. You will meet hostility from clergy and people. There are many who spit at the very name of Catholic. That's understandable. Then you know the reasons? I've read the history. In the 16th century, the then King Susneos entered in communion with the Catholic Church, but unwisely imposed harsh measures to bring about the reunion of the Coptic Church with Rome. His methods were never repudiated by your men of God during his lifetime or after his death. And that is why the Catholic clergy was expelled. That is why they were forbidden to enter the country under penalty of death. King Ubi, history is a stern teacher. The mistakes will not be repeated. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you propose to proceed? The love that the Christ we have in common taught is the only way men can be persuaded to accept him and his church. At present, about half of our people are Christians. Of the Coptic church? Yes. The rest are Jews, Mohammedans, and what you would call heathen. To carry on the government, I would prefer a clear majority of Christians. Well, I'd prefer not to become involved with the political differences of the people. As I would prefer to remain aloof from religious differences. But unfortunately, political differences are often grounded in the religious isn't this true of Europe? Sadly, I admit it is. It's a sad thing when those who claim Christ as their king and savior are divided. You are wise men both. Tell me, how does this happen? As I told you, King Ubi, in the early days of the church, learned men differed about the nature of Christ. But are we not all agreed he is the son of God? That is so. That is our one great hope for unity. Then how is our church different from yours? The Coptic Church teaches that human and divine nature of Christ is single, one and the same. Surely he was on earth in the form of a man like the rest of us. But in that form, his nature was dual, human and divine. You mean he was two persons in one? No, no, no. It's heresy to say Christ was two persons. But you just said he was human and divine. Well, we must distinguish between person and nature. Human nature is composed of body and soul. In a human person is an added perfection which makes each one an individual, distinct from all others. Now, you can see that in every man you meet. Ah, that's what makes one man a coward, another brave. One able to learn quickly, while another, even his brother, may be slow. That is right. Then how did Christ, in the form of man, differ from all others? In his nature. A person has only one nature. Now, take your coward, for instance. In a crisis, he wants to act bravely, but fearing the consequences, weighing the pros and cons, he does nothing. His nature becomes timid, cowardly. And Christ was not permitted to be like that. Because of his two natures, human and divine. The proof is that when on earth he did works that only God could do. Like raising Lazarus from the dead. Yes. Still, he lived the way of ordinary man. He wept cried out in pain. He bled when pierced with a spear. So it was. Wherein lies the difference between our churches? The Coptic church denies the two natures of Christ. It teaches he has one nature. Then it's the difference between one and two. Only to the layman, King Ubi. Oh, such a little difference. It's not so simple. There is a profound theological distinction. Then discuss it with Father Justin, for my knowledge of theology is slight. Father Justin stationed two priests at Gondar, the Amharic capital, and he made his headquarters at Adua. For the next two years, he devoted his time to learning all there was to know about the country, its language, its people, and their customs. He devoted himself to breaking down prejudices by kindness and humility. Then, in 1841, he arranged a conference with the dissident clergy. My brothers, I have known our next speaker from the day he arrived in our land. I could say many things about him, as is the custom at introductions. But I do not, because when a man is his own best reference, it's wiser to remain silent. I ask you now to listen to Father Justin de Jacobis. 
My brothers in Christ, without hesitation, I address you thus. For regardless of the theological differences that divide us, I know that just as fervently as any Roman Catholic, the clergy of the Coptic Church and many of your people embrace Christ. If we examine what we have in common, we find we have much. So much that the differences are small in comparison. But let us speak no more of differences. I come to you not as a critic or a fault finder, but as your friend and your servant. I come because I love you with the love we all have for Jesus. I come because I want to help. Tell me. Show me what I can do, and I will do it. Bless you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Justin, a number of our notables have asked me to send a deputation to Alexandria to ask the patriarch to appoint a primate. I've explained to Father Justin it's the only see that's been vacant for a number of years, and it's the custom for the patriarch to appoint one of his monks to the position. Why has he delayed so long? It's partly our fault. We assumed he would make an appointment, and he most likely was waiting for us to make the request. Can I be of any help? I want you to accompany the deputation. You want me, a Roman Catholic, to do this? We feel the presence of a respected European would make a favorable impression. Egypt has always regarded our land as an unruly stepchild. Well, I'm placed in a very awkward position, King Ubi. Well, in what way? To associate myself even quasi-officially with a Coptic deputation might be interpreted as church recognition of Coptic doctrine. But couldn't the reverse be true? What do you mean? that Father Justin's presence might indicate our acceptance of the Catholic position. Perhaps the time has come to settle these theological disputes. These distinctions may be vital to learned men. But to me, who has to conduct a government, it seems like hair-splitting. Surely you wouldn't suggest that Father Justin go against his Pope and accept the Coptic Church? No, 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 of course not. I don't want him to get into trouble with his superiors. Father, is there any way you can join the deputation without bringing down a reprimand? If you could give me a letter to the patriarch urging reunion with the Roman Church and permit the deputation to visit Rome as an official mission from Ethiopia to the Holy See. What do you think, Abba Michael? I can see where it would justify Father Justin's presence with the deputation, but does our clergy wish reunion with Rome? I would like to see an end to dissension. The patriarch has treated us badly, and a request to join with the Romans may frighten him and make him pay more attention to us in the future. King Ubi, if you are using this request as a device and are not... Father, I've always been open with you. I'd much rather stay out of religious questions. I'm a Christian. That's enough for me. If the clergy and the people want a Roman church, I'll accept. If they want a Coptic church, I'll accept that. These fine distinctions are beyond me. And I think they should be settled by churchmen so I can give my time to governmental affairs. Yeah, but King Obi... Hear me he... out. My indifference as to which church may shock you and Father Justin. But I'm a layman, one of many. And I say it's time that the learned men who bring about these disputes should settle them and bring some unity to Christendom. I grant your request, Father Justin, not in an offhand manner, but because it may open the way for the Pope and the Patriarch to communicate with each other. But I don't think the patriarch... Let us wait, Abba Michael. I withdraw my objection. I will gladly go with the deputation. At first, most members of the deputation ignored Father Justin as a Latin and a heretic. Then his humility and consideration won them over. And by the time they reached Cairo, they were calling him Abba Jacob. Abba meaning father in their language. Abba Michael, where are the others? Weren't we to meet here? The others have left. Something's wrong. What is it? The patriarch denounced the Roman Sea and will have nothing to do with it. Well, that is bad news. 
However, we did anticipate the Patriarch might refuse us. The deputation left because all who have anything to do with you are threatened with excommunication. But King Ubi's letter... The Patriarch threw it into the fire. And what of your request for a primate? That we will have. The election will be held in a few days. I'll go on to Rome by myself. At once? Oh, I'll stay until after the election. I'll pack now and find another place to stay. No, don't leave. But to be with me puts you under the threat of excommunication. You must not lose your church because of me. The patriarch is forcing me to make a stand. Abba Michael, where do you stand? At this moment, at the crossroads. Abba Michael, is that the primate? The one several monks are talking to? Yes. He is the elected one. Oh, he's little more than a youth. He has taken the name Salama. He is below canonical age. How could he be elected? It was done to punish Ethiopia. One sympathetic to us told us the patriarch was using flagrant intrigue to give us the worst possible primate. In addition to his youth, he is ignorant and arrogant. I'll return to Ethiopia as quickly as possible after reporting to the Pope. Several members of the deputation want to go with you. But the patriarch... They defy his threat of excommunication. And you, Abba Michael? After looking forward for years to meeting the patriarch, I have. Now I would like to see your holy father. Meet me at the ship. It sails in two hours. The depleted delegation was warmly received by Pope Gregory XVI, and they assisted at Mass in St. Peter's on the Assumption. They were greatly impressed, and on the way back at Jerusalem, one member asked to be received into the Catholic Church. Little by little, in spite of ignorance, misunderstanding, and slander, a Catholic nucleus was formed. Now a college was needed to train a future generation of clergy, and Abba Jacob started looking for a site. This activity and the growing popularity of the priest had not gone unnoticed by Abunda Salama, the young primate. King Ubi, I demand you order this priest, Justin de Jacobus, to leave the country at once. Demand? Yes. Yes, I do. I am primate. I am responsible for the religion of the people. And I have jurisdiction over the land within our boundaries and shall say who comes and who goes. Then refuse him the right to travel about. Why? Why? Don't you know he's planning to build a college? He's converting our people. Against their will? By sly methods. By preaching false doctrine. You know my views about religion and government. A number of learned men, among them Abba Michael, have become Catholic. There must be a sound basis for their conversion. Then you'll not order this priest to go. No. Then I shall make it impossible for him to move about. I shall excommunicate anyone who will give him food or drink when traveling. You have my permission to leave. I go, but I promise you'll regret this. The excommunication decree had little effect. In 1845, the college was opened. And a year later, Monsignor William Maceo was appointed the first bishop to Ethiopia. The primate's persecution became open and intensified. What is it, Abba Michael? A friendly native brought this message to me. It has been sent to all the chiefs by Subagadis, who is Salama's patron. Oh. Read it. Uh, kill Abba Jacob and all his people. To kill even one who follows his religion is to earn seven heavenly crowns hereafter. You have to go into hiding. You are now a hunted man. Oh, you really think that this... This is not Salama's futile excommunication. This goes to the savage tribes who would risk anything to earn a reward in the hereafter. We must appeal to King Ubi. He can't give protection. 
Yedar F. Kassa, commander of the troops, connives with Salama, who will give his support if Kassa will banish the Catholic clergy. The clergy? What of the people? They will be told to renounce Catholicism or suffer the consequences. Go to the college and tell them to be prepared to evacuate at a moment's notice. I'll go and warn the bishop. The college and other groups were dispersed. Catholicity was outlawed, and the bishop had to withdraw to Aden. But before leaving, he gave Father Justin Episcopal consecration, which enabled him to celebrate Mass, administer the sacraments, especially holy orders, according to the Ethiopic rite, whenever that seemed desirable. Abba Michael. But who calls? Are you alone? Yes, yes, but who... How about Jacob? Some warriors came by. I had to hide in the brush. Where can we go and be safe? I have a cave. Follow me, but not too closely, so I can signal you if I run into danger. Because of conditions, the bishop decided I should be consecrated to the office. You should not have come back. It's death if you are caught. What would those I led to the faith think of me if I remained away at the time of crisis? But if you die... Who will there be to administer the sacraments? You. Me? But you know I'm That's not That's a... why I've looked for you so long. As my first Episcopal act, I wish to ordain you priest. Are you ready? I am ready, Father. In spite of the persecution, perhaps because of it, there followed a period of startling success. And by 1853, there were a score of Ethiopian priests and over 5,000 Catholic laymen. But now, Kassa, the army commander who had bought the primate's support with a promise to drive out all Catholics, waged a series of battles that made him king of all Ethiopia. The primate acted quickly. Under arrest. I was expecting you. May I have a moment to get my breviary and my... You will come at once. Priest, it's fortunate you are a foreigner. Otherwise, you would be beaten until you renounced your heresy. You've applied the whip to many of your own people, and they died Catholic. Yes, a few. But a dead Catholic can do me no harm. Every man you kill, every man you convert with a whip is a defeat for you. You will be escorted to the frontier. Should you reach Rome, tell your superiors that I intend to eradicate every vestige of your church. Tell them to send no more priests to us. As a primate of your church, you must know the duty and obligation of a priest. I know my obligation. What is yours? As long as there are Catholics in Ethiopia, I must try to come to them. If you set foot in Ethiopia again, you will die. I'm sure you would like to hear about some of the priests you've ordained. Oh, yes. Yes, tell me of Abba Michael, of Talca. It gives me great satisfaction to tell you they have been arrested and are now in prison. So they are alive, thank God. At present, they'll be given an opportunity to recant. Never. See this? This whip is made from the tail of a giraffe. Run your hand along it. The hair is like steel wire. How staunch a Catholic do you think Abba Michael and the others will be when they've been lashed across the bare back with it? In the name of the Savior you profess to worship and who was scourged, I beg you not to torture them. <laughs> My only regret is that you'll not be there to witness it. Guards, take him away. Bind him for his journey to the frontier. Oh, Captain. Sire? You will remain for a moment. Captain, you will take the priest to Sanaa. But perhaps before he arrives, he will disappear or fall into the hands of Mohammedan fanatics. When you come back, there will be a small reward for you. But the guards, many of whom Father Justin had helped, set him at liberty. After great suffering, 
and in continual danger, Father Justin arrived at a refuge near the Red Sea, where he continued his ministry. But again he was arrested, and again released when he was ransomed by a French diplomat. He tried to get back to his flock, but forced marches and abrupt changes of climate had weakened him. On July 31st, 1860, weak from fever, he fell from his horse and spoke his last words to a few of his disciples who were escorting him. Pray hard, little ones, for I am going to die. I won't forget you. I am dying. With these words, he pulled his cloak over his face and was dead. He was buried in the church at Hebo, and ever since, it has been regarded as the shrine of a saint by the people, both Catholic and dissident, who have never forgotten Abba Jacob. And on May 14th, 1939, the church sealed the tradition by declaring Justin de Jacobis blessed. Thank you.